Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lisette Coley, and I'm executive director of Parapsychology Foundation. And I have the privilege to being seated within the Eileen J. Garrett Library of the Parapsychology Foundation with Dr. Carlos S. Alvarado, who will be uh, talking this morning. So, good morning, Carlos. How are you? Good morning. Good very morning. good. Very good. It's a rather strange interview in that we are staff members of the foundation, mm -hmm. but since you are a noted parapsychologist, uh, before you came to the foundation, in point of fact, probably one of the reasons why you did come to Parapsychology mm -hmm. Foundation, why don't you share with us your present affiliation? Well, I'm currently working here at the Parapsychology Foundation in New York City. I'm the chairman of domestic and international programs of the foundation. And that involves uh, working in our different programs of education and publication. In addition, I'm the associate editor of the International mm -hmm. Journal of Parapsychology that is published by the Foundation. And also, I'm the editor of the Parapsychological Monograph series, which is a series of specialized monographs that the Foundation has been published since For the years. beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think you forgot one other piece of your job description, which would be the uh, coordinator for the PF Lyceum programs, uh, the educational arm yeah, of Parapsychology right. Foundation. Tell me a little bit about your educational background as to how you got into parapsychology. Well, I got interested in parapsychology when I was young, uh, before I finished my BA degree. Uh, I went and did a BA in psychology at the University of Puerto Rico, where I was living at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went into psychology because I was interested in parapsychology. I thought that psychology was the closest I could get mm -hmm. uh, to parapsychology, since I couldn't find any formal parapsychology program. So tell me, did you really then go into psychology knowing ahead of time that it was parapsychology that was going to drive you, or it was just yeah. a natural fit? No, I, I was already very, since high school, I have been interested in, in parapsychology. Mm -hmm. And I went into psychology because I wanted to do parapsychology. But I knew that there were no jobs in parapsychology, or just you know, very few, mm -hmm. certainly no jobs in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I decided I will study psychology, and maybe I can work in the field of psychology. And if I'm lucky in the future, maybe get in I will the back be able door, to get in the yeah. back door and do get some job related to parapsychology, or do parapsychology in my part-time. Part mm -hmm. Well, that was a rather gutsy move, I would assume. I mean, you were going up against uh, uh, quite a mountain there, nobody in Puerto Rico, and in reality, few people in the rest of the world yeah. really choose that path. Did you take a lot of flack from your professors with your stated interest in parapsychology? Not really. I, I didn't talk with so many of my professors about my real interest. There were like a couple of them that I talked with, and uh, they were either neutral or open-minded, but not particularly interested. So there was not a, not a position, but not encouragement you know, mm -hmm. either. It's sort of just so, a, it is yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah. Mo most people there in the, in the faculty of the university were not interested really in that topic. So you weren't within their radar screen at all, really, with what no. you were doing? No, not really. Which is probably why you were successful. <laughs> in any case, where did, you, where did you go on after your for graduate studies then? Well, after that, I went to California to a John F. Kennedy University, which mm -hmm. had a master's degree in, in parapsychology. What happened was, was that I made a connection with our state university in Puerto Rico. Uh, at one point, they were looking to develop a laboratory or a research center in parapsychology. Mm -hmm. And I was selected because I'm, I was connected with one of the persons in that program, and they knew about my interest and that I had been studying the field for many years. And basically, what they offered me was, they, they basically said that we will send you uh, out there to California to study parapsychology, you get your degree. Doesn't then sound like a back. bad deal. No, it was an excellent deal. Yeah. Then you come back and uh, you will teach here for us, you do research, and we will do our best to develop a parapsychology program. Mm -hmm. And that was great for me, except that when I was finishing my degree, I get this letter, which I will no. never forget, saying that, the, the, the whole thing will be canceled, you know, they will not be following up on, on the Why? idea of developing the center. Lack of funding? Part of it was the change in administration. You mm -hmm. know, in, in Puerto Rico, 
the, the state universities are, are heavily into politics. Mm -hmm. And depending on what political party is in power, mm -hmm. uh, people come and go and they change all the program of their predecessors. And the mm -hmm. person that has started this idea was very interested in what I would call progressive movements, which was not only parapsychology, but the idea was let's train local people in all the new disciplines from new areas in biology and engineering yeah, very much a to things like then, parapsychology, yeah. which will uh -huh. be probably the most uh, radical uh, ones. And this would have been what, um, the early 70s? But this would yeah. Okay. yeah, that was in, well, no, not the early, that was around 1978. Oh. 78, uh -huh. 79. And uh, both the things ended well for me because uh, I didn't have a job to go back. And that was kind of a disappointment, but at the same time, they pay for all my education. And I had the opportunity, you know, going to California and, and finishing the degree. Mm -hmm. So I have so always So what did you happy. finally uh, wind up with? Uh, an MA in? Yeah, an MS. MS. Mm -hmm. A Master's in Science in, in Parapsychology. Mm -hmm. It was a, a very good program. Uh, the program was funded to a great extent, I think, by the Parapsychology yes, Foundation. Yes, we had great John hopes. Palmer was funded by the foundation. That's I believe right. he was the Garrett professor. Correct, correct, yes. At, at Again, the foundation has always tried to support formal education in parapsychology, and when we withdraw our support, the universities uh, tend not to pick it up for whatever reason, which is a, a great disappointment. But at least we have the solace of knowing that people such as yourself benefited yeah. at that time. I, I was time. one of those that benefited greatly from that program, and there have been a few other people that continue doing yes, work. Yes, for sure. That but for me, it was, it was very important because it, it allowed me first to you know, go out of Puerto Rico, uh, meet mm -hmm. people, make connections, and later on, you know, I ended working in the States. Uh, after I, I went back to Puerto Rico, I mean, I worked in Puerto Rico for a while, teaching psychology mainly. Mm -hmm. And then I was offered a job based in part on my involvement with the Kennedy program and with John Palmer by Ian Stevenson. He's wow. a psychiatrist uh, at the researcher. University of Virginia. Now retired, but at the time he was heading the division of parapsychology that was part of the psychiatry department of UVA and uh, basically you know he offered me a job and he uh, doesn't suffer fools so that was no, uh, that was, I, a, I was, that yeah. was a feather in your cap <laughs> I yeah. was interviewed first you know I made a trip to the place and well, I was offered the job and, uh, and then I moved to the states it was in 1982 82. and since then I have most of the time I have been living outside mainly in the United States from there, I moved to, to Durham, North Carolina, after four years in Virginia, working with Stevenson, mm -hmm. uh, with reincarnation cases and near-death experiences mm -hmm. and many of the other things. As you know, you know Stevenson does work uh, with phenomena related to the idea of survival of bodily death. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, there were no more funds to pay my position in... A recurrent theme. Yeah, in yeah that's, that's very yeah, common yeah. parapsychology. You know, people kind of move from one place to the other depending on the money. So it was my time to move, so I moved to, to North Carolina, Durham. And, and there I, was, I did some graduate work at the, the history department of Duke University. I ended up getting a master's in history. But while I was there, I was affiliated with the Institute for Parapsychology, that was the. The, the precursor or the. The organization yeah. of the... The organization uh, that came originally from the Duke, the Duke University uh, Parapsychology Lab. Laboratory. Which has now evolved into what, the Rhine Research Center? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, they're still down there in, in Durham. So I had an informal uh, association with them, or I had a desk and kind of a base of operations mm -hmm. where I could do... I, st I still was doing writing and publishing papers. So it's good to have a place where you can use a library and... And just sit down to write and It's and possibly one of the reasons why we uh, convinced you to come up to Parapsychology Foundation. Well, that was a magnificent a, library, right? That, that was a big, uh, that was <laughs> a a big incentive because, you know, having more than 10,000 volumes here, and not only that, but a lot of complete runs of the main journals in the field and some of the old journals. It's, it's a unique place to work, and for someone like me that is interested in the old literature, the historical uh, things, uh, yeah. it's, this is the place to be. You know. Well, then you went uh, to finish up your Ph.D. where at the... Yeah, from Durham, North Carolina, I, I decided, you know, I wanted to get more education and get a doctoral degree. So I applied and was accepted in the uh, Edinburgh uh, program, Ph.D. psychology program. Mm -hmm. Basically there, they have uh, what they call the Kessler Parapsychology Unit, 
which is a unit of researchers inside the psychology department of the University of Edinburgh at Edinburgh Scotland. Funded by the author uh, in his will, yeah. Arthur Kessler. Arthur Kessler, <coughs> yeah, he left some money for a chair in parapsychology. And the chair eventually landed in Edinburgh. And they have been doing a lot of good work since. But at the time, that was the best place for me, I thought. First, because I knew the person that was holding the chair, Professor Robert Morris, mm -hmm. an old friend. And you know, I like to work with him. Second, because the, the psychology department there works uh, following the European system of education. That in, means in graduate mm -hmm. degrees, you don't go to do more coursework. You do basically I go there to do only research. And that uh, was suited for me almost perfectly because I have already taken many courses in psychology. I had a lot of training in psychology. So and also sort of in been doing there, done that, research. I, I only needed the opportunity to get a degree doing research and then learning more by doing supervised research, which mm -hmm. is what you get at Edinburgh. It's a great opportunity. And that's what I did. I eventually moved and, and finished my degree in 97. Mm -hmm. In 97. Mm -hmm. Now, you've made a name for yourself. Obviously, I know you've served as the, the past president of the Parapsychological Association, mm -hmm. and I believe that uh, you did such a good job. They re-upped you, and you're serving uh, mm -hmm. in 2002 as the yes. current um, president of the Parapsychological Association. What would you say you're best known for in, within the field? What are your particular interests? Well, I, I would say I have two main areas. Uh, first, the, the historical perspective of the field. I, I'm known by a lot of parapsychologists by writing papers on, about the old literature. Mm -hmm. I select a particular topic and I try to trace the history of the concept, the history of research. Mm -hmm. The point I'm always trying to make is for, for people living now in, in present time that not to forget the old literature, which is something very common among parapsychologists, but it's also common in many other disciplines, you know. You think we try and reinvent the wheel yeah, unnecessarily? Yeah, I think that happens frequently. We reinvent the wheel, we try to reinvent methods, terminology, even concepts and models, all, all kinds of things that mm -hmm. have been done before. Sometimes they have been done even better than what they've been done mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Other times, you know, the, the current work is also good, but the point is that if you know what has happened before and you're well informed, I believe you can do a much better job in the present. We should not work in, in ignorance. Mm -hmm. And that's the point I'm always trying to make. And at first I started with very short articles or letters to the correspondence section of some of the journals. And eventually I, I published a lot of papers on different mm -hmm. uh, aspects of the historical literature to the point that some people are afraid to see me, me coming. coming you know, I know. <laughs> some people have told me, you know, if you find something that I forgot in my paper, yeah. don't write a letter. You just come and just tell, me, tell and me, and I will read the paper, and uh -huh. which uh -huh. is kind of funny. Uh -huh. but, but I enjoy doing that. You know, uh, you learn a lot working in the library and doing that type of research. But anyhow, that was one area that I that really carved out for that yourself. I, yeah, that I did work, and the other one is work on out of body experiences. Mm -hmm. I have also published several papers on out of body experiences. Some of them literature reviews. Others are uh, studies, basically questionnaire studies, in which uh, I approach people and I ask them about to describe their out-of-body experience and uh, to fill out psychological questionnaires, the purpose being to develop a psychological profile of the person that has an out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the more we know about those things, the better, the better position we will be to build theories to understand the experience and eventually to give back to people, to, to basically be able to to counsel to people about why they have certain experiences, why some people have them more than Put in a framework for them. Put in a framework of their own mm -hmm. life, why the experiences are different. Uh, right now, that's what we're exploring. You know, we know the experience uh, occurs, even if we cannot explain it. And we know something about the psychology, you know, what type of people have it and what people that mm -hmm. do not have it. You know, we have a lot of comparison of those two types of people. Mm -hmm. So we have learned quite a lot. But we still need to do much more work to refine that knowledge and to, and to really try to find some causes about uh, you know, what is really causing this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Again, it's, a very, it's very difficult because it's the same problem that you find in the whole field of parapsychology and in psychology in general, that we progress only 
in step by mm -hmm. step. And then it seems and sometimes we take wind up taking two steps backwards before we. Yeah, know, it takes many many years. And but it's a, if you like research, as, as like I do, it's a very satisfying uh, process. So anyhow, the out of body experience is my the second major concern. That well, in my let me career. ask you: Have you ever had an, a question that most people must ask you? Have you ever had an, an OB experience yourself, or mm -hmm. what kind? What drew you to this interest in parapsychology? You mentioned in high school, but what was the catalyst yeah. for that? Uh, no, I, I <coughs> never had any an out of body experience, nor any major uh, parapsychological experience. I have had very minor things, like thinking of people and getting a phone call from mm -hmm. them, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. but nothing really very impressive. Nothing that really will convince me. My interest comes basically from studying the experiences of other people. In the case of out of body experiences, I have to say that it was basically when I started studying the literature, I found the experience fascinating by itself, you know, even more than, than the rest of, of the phenomena. And, uh, and it was so interesting that, that I continued reading more about it. And when I had the opportunity, which the first time was when I went to the Kennedy program in California, I did my master's thesis on out of body experiences. That was the beginning mm -hmm, of my mm -hmm. career as a researcher. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I, it, the interest comes mo it's more money intellectual, mm -hmm. you know, reading and seeing the, the experience. But there was no others. family member or anybody that sort of. Uh, I I had family members. I had particularly a godmother that that has a lot of experiences. But I really started finding that in detail after I became, was in the field ah. and I was already developed my interest. The, the time came, you know, that I sat with her and I even interviewed her and tape recorded a lot of her experiences. And she was, she's a fascinating person. You know, she has had almost all the experiences I was asking for. You know, I had her fields, some of my questioners, mm -hmm. and she, she said yes to all the major experiences. Some of them more frequent than others, but she has had them almost all of them. And uh, that has been through all her life. And that also, I mean, later on, that gave me, you know, more Impetus energy to, to go really on go and, and, and more understanding of the importance of, of these experiences to people. But the initial interest was not from, from family. It was, you know, basically from, from reading the, the literature. Well, I wanted to ask you what your primary contact with Parapsychology Foundation was. Was it through our publications or did that yes. uh, Yeah. It was through, through publication. My first contact was around 1972. I always remember it was around October of 1972 when I was in Puerto Rico and I decided I'm interested in these things. If I don't, don't move and find information myself, I'm not going to learn anything about these things. Not easy so, being a self-starter though, Carlos. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. <laughs> don't do that. But that's so what I did, you know, being separated and in, in Puerto Rico, and those were the days before email. You have to remember that. You uh -huh. know, there no websites, the email right. didn't exist, at least not for me. I guess the government will have it, but, mm -hmm. you know, the normal people out there didn't have it. So I had to do it the old-fashioned way, you know, getting addresses from books that I found and sitting down and writing letters. Mm -hmm. And uh, around that time, I wrote a letter to the foundation and getting back information about your publications, the magazine Parapsychology Review, and the proceedings and the monograph series. Mm -hmm. uh, I ordered a, a lot of things from the foundation and subscribed to the review. Good, <laughs> good. <laughs> and in a sense, uh, that's one of the reasons why I notice your continued interest. I know we're working on a, a, uh, a translation of a pamphlet that you had in Puerto Rico, uh, sort of a, a getting started or, or a parapsychology, what is it? Mm -hmm. um, so I would assume that uh, you appreciate the need for this dissemination of information. That oh, yeah. The foundation no, that's, has that's always very, done, and we're trying to go that's forward. That's very important, especially for people that are starting in the field, which at that time I was starting. Uh, having that information is basic, because you don't get new people coming into the field if you no. don't have accessible information. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what the foundation provided in the form of the review. You know, I had a lot of articles that were serious, were things that I could read and understand. But at the same time also, they were not so simplistic. You know, they made me think... They were well written, and and they encouraged me to go further. That also inspired me to to read in other journals. I subscribed to publications coming you know from other places, and kept reading and reading in the field until I started forming a general perspective of who you know what is parapsychology, what are parapsychologists doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember in those early days, I was reading everything that I could get my hands of from the popular books of people Very that say that they were mediums them, huh? and did automatic mm -hmm. writing. 
and communicated with spirits of their, their family members from that type of material to very technical experimental reports full of statistical analysis. M many of the analysis which I, at that time I, I didn't understand them completely but I felt they were important so I pushed myself to read through them. And I felt that I learned a lot by just mm -hmm. being exposed. You know. So mm -hmm. I, I certainly agree that having good information you can you build know, and go forward. You can really things. build, and I think that is what really makes a difference to make, to make a career. And even if you don't make a career in this field, to, to get a good understanding and a first step for further study. It's really mm -hmm. basic to have mm -hmm. good materials like that. Well, it sounds like uh, everything that you did uh, led you to certainly uh, be one of the leaders of the so-called field of parapsychology, as I mentioned, being PA president. Um, can you discuss sort of the wider perspective of how do you, what do you think about parapsychology today? Where would you like it to go, perhaps? Well, parapsychology today... Oh, where is it? Let's start off with yeah. where is it right now, the state of parapsychological yeah. research? I'm afraid that parapsychology today is not doing so well. And it's not so much the, la the, you know, the fault of the people in the field. I think parapsychology still is fighting to be recognized. Mm -hmm. There is still a lot of skepticism when you present your papers in a lot of the established forums, like the main journals of psychology or other areas of science. Sometimes uh, people are so skeptical they just don't even want to consider your findings. Yeah, it seems there's no gray um, area, is there, Carlos? It's either they want to believe in everything or they reject that's, everything. That's the, mo the most and common position. Yeah, that yeah, there, are, there are few people or. that are kind of in the middle. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, uh, and the problem with that is, uh, you know, to do research, we need to do research to understand the phenomena, to try to explain it. But if you don't have resources to do the research, there's very little that can be done. Mm -hmm. And when you go to a lot of the science uh, founding, funding agencies, uh, they don't fund parapsychology because they're skeptical about it. They, they just don't think there is anything there. So the field really is, gets uh, reduced because it says no money to do research. There are few places around the world. That means you have a very small number of people. That's what's happening today and has been the case for many years. Mm -hmm a very small number of people that are devoted to the topic full-time. Uh, I, I cannot even guess how many people there are, but there are not even 30 or 40 people full-time full -time you know, around the world. Then there are more people that do things part-time, and that, then the number you know, kind of expands. Mm -hmm. But when you compare that to other fields of science, like physics, biology, psychology, you have thousands, if not more, of people working in, in in the problems of those fields, mm -hmm. having laboratories, having a lot of resources. But there is no wonder that parapsychology does so, so little progress because we just don't have the resources. No manpower. So that's one thing that I see today. We're really in a sorry state because the field is really small. And what I would like to see is more access to resources, funding. Once we have that, more people will come, more research can be conducted, the knowledge will grow up. But still having said that, even under these conditions, I think parapsychologists had collected an incredible amount of evidence and have done a lot of good work. Good uh, science. Good science, I mean, yeah, trying implement. to explore uh, this phenomena. You know, there are people that do a lot of laboratory experiments where they bring people to the laboratory and they test them for ESP, for psychokinesis, mm -hmm. to see if they can perform in the laboratory. They analyze uh, all the results they use in statistical methods. Uh, others, which are in a minority today, but still is, gets done, deal with what we call spontaneous cases. Those are the experiences that happen to people in daily life, such as having a dream about some mm -hmm. future event. Well, there are people that collect those dreams, try to put them together, and then try to find commonalities you know, between the dreams and, and try to understand something about the phenomena. Because we know these things happen, but the task of parapsychology is First, to find better evidence for the phenomena, but mainly then to try to understand why are people having dreams of this sort, of the future? Mm -hmm. Why do people in laboratory tasks can affect b computers or can get information from some, something that someone is thinking at, mm -hmm. in a distant location, which we, we will call ESP? How does that work? That, that will be the second mm -hmm. step once mm -hmm. you think that you have evidence the thing happens. But the only way of finding that out is through research. Because the, the idea, the, the findings come only when you collect data, you analyze it, you accumulate information over uh, uh, many, many years of studies. And I think we have a lot of good information now, 
But the problem is how, how to go forward with the few resources that we have. So that's how I see parapsychology today as having done a lot of good things, having a lot of good people, but not being able to do more because of the, the lack of funding. Of the lack of funding and then the lack of, of people that are doing research, the lack of physical facilities like laboratories and the mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I will say that a lot of the things that are being done today are very interesting and continue to, to remind us, you know, of the idea of, the, of human potential, which is one of, one of the, my main interests in mm -hmm. what I see the value of parapsychology is that it, it is showing us. Applications, in other words. I mean, not so much applications, but, but it's, it's a reminder, even more than psychology does, that the human being has a lot of untapped potential. Mm -hmm. You know, we always hear things like people popularly say, well, we, we don't use only, except only a small part yeah, of the brain. And the mind is a terrible we, thing to The mind waste. has a lot of yeah, powers, yeah. a lot of abilities. And I think what parapsychology does is, is try to show empirically that that is the case and that the, abil the abilities may require explanations others than what psychology uh, has been accumulated for many years at least in, for some of the phenomena. Other, all, other parts of phenomena, including things like seeing apparitions, out-of-body experiences, some of those cases may have explanations similar to what psychiatry mm -hmm. and psychology uh, you know, talk about. Mm -hmm. But the final decision has to come through research, just through an examination of the, of the phenomena. Well, given your, your expertise with a historical perspective, would you say that the field has really progressed along the same tenets or track that was started, uh, what, perhaps by the members of the British SPR, or has it evolved drastically? Is it, is it pretty much, I mean, we're we following just uh, the natural evolution of scientific methodology as it, it becomes more I, technological? I, I think we can say from the point of view of, of using the methods of science and, and using technology, we have seen a, a progression which that is from the old days, you know, till now we can see big differences mm -hmm. in terms of, of becoming more experimental and more technological, excuse me, in the sense of, of using computer technology uh, much more mm -hmm. in the field. Uh, it's the same that we see in other fields, you know, psychology has also uh, been like that. In parapsychology, we use a lot of computers now to analyze our data because computers allow you, give you the power to analyze our millions of bits of information that you can put together and combine in ways that are not obvious to the naked eye. That's why people use statistical methods to, to analyze it because when you have a lot of bits of information and, and there, is, there is so much around, uh, the patterns are not always visible to the naked eye. So you, you need to use methods basically to enhance or to find, dissect what is in, in the data. And that's why technology comes very useful with computers. Mm -hmm. uh, an area that we would like to see more development related to computer, but it's still very slow because it's very expensive, is the whole area of psychophysiology or medical studies. Of, that using of MRIs? Using or MRIs or? and all that new technology to see how the body, especially the nervous system works. That, a lot of people say, and I think it's true, is the, is the way of the future. And certainly we would like to know more what's happening in the brain or in the nervous system mm -hmm. in general when someone is having a, what we call ESP hits, basically is getting ESP information mm -hmm. at that moment. So at that moment, at that moment, what is the process? If with good technology now, we should be able to do that, those kinds of studies. But uh, those studies really almost, they do not exist. You hear people saying about ideas. Well, I think what, just to have a regular MRI uh, for a broken ankle is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So I would But it's very hard to have an access to an MRI. You know, you have to go to, to a hospital or mm -hmm. to a, a place that has it. They can, the technology is still very, very expensive, mm -hmm. you know. And then if a place has it, you have to make the case uh, that you need time to use it, time that may be taken out from people that are suffering from some conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, there are all these issues that, but the but main thing see, is we don't have feel, access. But you feel somewhat them. optimistic that with the, the interest of what the National Institutes of Health or whatever, they have done some uh, healing at a distance, supported some healing at a distance. Yeah. So perhaps there is a degree of... No, of I, I think there is a degree and we, we're seeing trends of people from other disciplines having all these healing experiments. We see physicians and people from outside parapsychology being interested mm -hmm. in the area. And I think that's very positive, and I will hope that it will develop would build. Yeah, we will develop more. The thing is, when you're in parapsychology, you learn to be really cautious, because we have seen a lot of trends and a lot of things that come and go, 
and we have seen a lot of, of periods where things look really exciting and people were almost sure that parapsychology was going to enter, you know, academia was going to be completely accepted. Mm -hmm. And that has never happened till today. It doesn't mean that it will not happen. I believe one day it will it, it will, will. The problem that I see is how to get out of this hole that we are in because we don't have the means to do the research that, that we want to. And yet the recent Gallup poll, right, has uh, stated that uh, the normal man in the street has mm -hmm. uh, taken our concepts and the possibilities, at least, yeah. on board to a greater degree. Yeah, that's true. That, that's an interesting thing. It's because a, It's what, a strange that, dichotomy that while the public yeah. is becoming more accepting, yeah. academia still The public remains. in general has always had high beliefs in, in all these claims of parapsychological phenomena, partly because they have had their own experiences and they know these things happen. It's not that a question of pos a possibility. So they don't really want to know how it works? I think, just I think many of them are not concerned with how with it works. They believe that they have evidence they, the thing exists. You know, people that have had dreams, they have seen apparitions of people that have died. That type of experience that can be very, very strong and can change your life. A lot of people have those and they have their conviction and uh, they don't look at science necessarily to validate it. But then, then there are others that because they have experience, they believe that science should explore it, mm -hmm. and they're very, very positive about mm -hmm. it. The problem is that that doesn't transform in bringing resources Into to those of us economy. that do the science. And that's the problem that we have. We, did, we have to work within the small scientific community, and the small scientific community tends to be close-minded, and they're not willing to provide the resources. So even through all these interests out there, and, and when you do surveys, a lot of people experience this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. But we're working almost in different worlds, you know, and that's what makes it hard. Sounds like trickle-down economics, but a very, very yeah. small trickle. Still, the, the good <laughs> thing is when you go out, people help you in doing research. You know, they fill your questionnaires and they believe it's important. I have had that experience myself. Where it's well, you've done a lot of survey work, right? Yeah, I've done question a lot of is. Survey. And it's really that you find someone that, that will tell you no, or even if they don't believe it, they want to help you because they know you're mm -hmm. trying to do something serious. So, so it's good to, I, I like a lot to work with people like that. And that encourages Well, that's to the continue. essential human condition. Those are the people who yeah. are experiencing the phenomena that we're, no, that's true. That and, we're and I always examine. think, you know, when I'm in contact with them, they, this is why I'm doing what I do. It's not only to stay within science, you know, it's so that what we learn goes out and we can tell them what we have learned, we can assure them uh, about the meaning of their experiences, if we can say something about it. And basically, you know, put all that knowledge to, to use to help people, or at least to, to give them information. Sometimes you don't have to help them in a practical way. A lot of what I do, for example, here at the foundation, mm -hmm. I don't help people in a practical way. I don't solve their problems, but just lending a friendly ear to someone, not laughing at their experiences. That's therapeutic to a certain that, extent. Yeah, yeah, that's extremely therapeutic, and they feel good. And a lot of them, when they leave, they thank me. They say, I have done, I don't feel I have done so much for them. But a lot of them tell me, no, you, you have listened to me. You have given me information about your studies, the mm -hmm. studies of others. I feel better. I, I feel now that I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. The people that laugh at me, now, now I can put that on perspective. And they feel that they, they get something from the stuff that, that we are doing. Here. Yeah, so you've taken it so out of just the, the scientific laboratory and given it a raison yeah, d'etre. I think that that's very important. That's something that we don't have much in the field. But again, it comes back to the issue. We have so few people, so mm -hmm. we don't have enough people to, for, to do the research or the talking to the general public. It's just uh, we have to stretch ourselves too much. Stretch ourselves too yeah. much. Well, as we start to close our uh, interesting conversation, I know personally that you're known within the field for your um, interest in a multicultural perspective. I believe you, you serve also as the president of the Ibero uh, Association. Oh, yeah. You say it for me, Ibero Carlos. American Parapsychological uh -huh. Association. Uh, and definitely behind the thought that this is not just a Western enterprise yeah. here. So perhaps you could talk about the multicultural perspective, because yeah, I know well, that's near and dear to your heart. Another thing, from the beginning, as I was saying, my interest in the historical perspective was basically to remind people about the past. I tried to do a similar thing about regarding the work that is conducted outside of the United States and things that are published in languages other than English, mm -hmm. Spanish, French, Italian, 
or in German mm -hmm. or a lot of the Asian languages. It also comes down to languages. dissemination of information, yeah, right? And not reinventing the wheel. I mean, there are but other voices out there that One problem that heard. happens in science a lot and in parapsychology is that people center on their own, on their own language, their own culture. Here in the States is in English mm -hmm. and what happens in these states. Very Not only for psychology, in, in every field. Mm -hmm. And that's a natural thing, you know, we, we all work with what we know best, but we tend to neglect a lot of fascinating work that goes outside. And what I have tried to do is bring reminders. I say every time I can review a book that is published in South America or in, or in Europe, mm -hmm. books that very rarely reach uh, the, the average English-speaking parapsychologist. Except the Eileen uh, Garrett Library, yeah, of course. Yeah, here's, here's <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to come. But the, uh, the general parapsychologist, do, he doesn't hear about things in Spanish or, or in French. And, of course, he doesn't have the language. To really... Um, yeah, so, so he or she just has and to depend on And these are difficult concepts to consider, so... Uh, yeah, it and one of the things I try to do is summarize our literature, so that at least mm -hmm. there is a summary published so someplace, the source and they know that that exists. Once that happens, then they have no excuse, you know, they, uh -huh. and, that, and that's what I try to do. I, I keep telling them, you know, don't forget about this group in France or this researcher in Brazil that is doing this study or that other study. And uh, hopefully the more we talk about those things, uh, the more doors will, will open. Also, it's very important to bring people to our forums. I have tried to do with, with that with people in Latin America, I have, for example, one forum that I organize in, for one of the parapsychological association conventions in which I brought people from Latin America, from Mexico, from Argentina, mm -hmm. and from Brazil. They came to the States, they presented about the state of parapsychology in their countries, explaining their problems to their colleagues, uh, mainly uh, here in the States. And uh, it's very important to change the ex exchange of ideas so that researchers understand the Sometimes we define a field on the basis of, say, what's happening here in the States, and they forget that in some countries, even having a normal computer can be very expensive and sometimes even difficult to have. That systems such as email communication are not so reliable in some countries as they are here in the United States and in Europe. And small things like that can make a lot of difference when you try to gather data to do your science. You know, all these things compound and, and go against you in, in doing parapsychology. And I think it's important for researchers here to understand that, and also for researchers outside to come and learn more of what is being done here. Mm -hmm. Because there is no question that, that American efforts in parapsychology, and now also European efforts, are basically what are, are, are the best of, of the field, and are, that's the word that is mm -hmm. the, what is directing the future trends. So no matter where you are in the world, you have to know what's happening here. So it's not only that the people here ignore what's out there. Out there, you also have to know what's happening over here. Basically, at that, moving to a type of global uh, knowledge, which is still far from, from real. And we have big language problems, you know. Mm -hmm. We cannot translate everything. And it's, no, I it's know the Foundation's there. International Journal of Parapsychology that you're the uh, assistant editor is translated into, the abstracts are translated into, what is yeah. it, five or six languages? I think six, I think six languages. Six languages now. Yeah, and yeah some that, I think that's a big help because that gives you the, the gist of the article and someone that is really interested can contact the author or may pay for a translation mm -hmm. or contact a colleague uh, to to help you, you know, I do that on occasions of languages that I don't cannot read. I will send an email to someone that I know has the language and ask them, "Can you give me a summary of this?" Mm -hmm. You know, so that I know if it's relevant to my work of, or not. Mm -hmm. And and then you move on, you know, you try to. Well, I think you should be commended, and we're very happy at the foundation to have you with us um, because you do put your money where your mouth is, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, in, in as much as I know within our website, www.parapsychology.org, you formulated, what, 34 bibliographies around uh, yeah. a topic, you and they're growing on, and on growing. different topics of parapsychology, from bo books to articles, or all of that information we have here at the Eileen Garrett Library. And then the bibliographies are designed to be short but very informative and to have some popular content and some technical content. Because mm -hmm. I think it's important for people, even if they're starting, to read more complicated material. Because the, if you read only easy stuff, your mind stays kind of at, at, a, at a down level. But 
everyone can learn challenge more yourself. and challenge themselves. It's not that you, everyone has to end being a scientist, that's not the goal, but by reading different types of material, eventually you choose what's your favorite topic, your favorite you approach, sort of self -select but you're always to... challenging yourself and, and I think you learn more. That, that has been my case. And, uh, and I certainly would recommend it to everyone. You know, that's what I try to do in the bibliographies. So when people come here, or if they access them through the web, they, you can download them and print them at home from your own computer. You can follow up all, the, all those articles and books uh, if you have access to a library that, that carries them. Well, it seems like our conversation this morning has come full circle because we started mm -hmm. off with your, your impetus to read, 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 read everything, yeah, and it seems true. that uh, your advice to us today is to continue to read and saturate yeah. yourself. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the messages I, I always like to give people is that parapsychology is one of those fields, you know, that you, you're a student all your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, within your lifetime, you know, the problem is not going to be solved. In some ways, that makes it even more fascinating. But the point is, you need to be educating yourself all the time. And that's why we have facilities like this one on the Parapsychology Foundation. We maintain such a nice library with so many volumes and magazines and journals. Because it's necessary to keep abreast of developments, to keep thinking. And the only way that we're going to make sense of, of this phenomena is by keep studying so read read read, read and read, then read. reflect and reflect that's that's my basic message well i think that's a wonderful message thank you carlos very thank much you. and to another bibliography <laughs> thank you very much ladies and gentlemen hi there i'm lisa coley i'm president of parapsychology foundation so welcome to our youtube channel we have lots to look at so please check out our videos don't forget to subscribe thank you